Mike and Tug and Andy just sent you a quick text um, before we get started here. Sounds good. Tug, I know that's a lot to have you do two technological things at once. I get my phone. <laughs> There's a future ball player behind you. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we're up to almost 40. We're expecting about 60, but we'll give everybody about one more minute and then we'll jump in. So I, I see a couple of the questions on chat. Uh, one was a really good one. From Alan, will all of us uh, be following an agenda of different topics, or is this going to be wide open? And the answer is, it's going to be wide open. We do have uh, some topping, excuse me, some uh, some sort of points that we want to emphasize, um, talking points, if you will. Um, I have obviously some preset questions for these guys um, as we go through this, but. Uh, we want, we want the questions to come from you and anything and everything you could think of. So please get that chat going and we'll, we'll start here in about 30 seconds. That's how we'll, that's how we'll take all of our questions uh, is through the chat. And I think by able, you know, by being able to take those questions that way through the chat, it gives us a better understanding uh, of age groups and things like that, where everybody is coming from. We're assuming that most everybody on this is either a parent or a high school player or a parent of a high school player. Maybe middle school. All right, we're gonna go ahead and jump in. Uh, welcome, my name is Rob Hani. Uh, I'm the director at NVTBL. Um, and, and we appreciate you spending some time here with us today. Uh, we have a great group, a great panel here. We also have some special guests that I'll introduce, introduce as well that'll be able to chime in, um, you know, if needed. Um, but uh, I guess I'll start with the elder statesman. Ron Tugwell was uh, the head high school baseball coach at West Springfield High School uh, for 28 years and uh, developed hundreds of, of high school players, several pro players, and uh, if you've ever played at West Springfield, um, he didn't take care of his field very well, uh, but he won a lot, a lot of championships, and uh, the field at West Springfield, uh, as appropriately, has been named after him for many years. Um, also had a son that played at Virginia Tech in the Phillies organization, and uh, was a guidance counselor for, for many, many years, which uh, brings a lot to the table for us here today uh, from an academic perspective. Um, next we have, I don't know how your screen looks, but Andy Bradley, um, you'll see in the BBA in the background. Uh, Andy Bradley is one of the most knowledgeable uh, coaches, instructors in this area uh, in, in terms of college recruiting and has a tremendous amount of contacts uh, through the collegiate level uh, both locally, locally, regionally, and, and even nationally. He runs the Bradley Baseball Academy, former head coach at Gonzaga Co Collegiate High School, um, and, and has been a tremendous help with us here at MBTBL and, and for all of baseball in the Northern Virginia, D.C. area uh, over the past decade or so. So welcome, Andy. And uh, Mike Cassidy, Coach Cassidy, I'll give the college guy the last shout out here. Coach Cassidy uh, is an assistant coach at Marymount University. Um, I think we felt it was important to get a college guy on this, uh, at this meeting. Um, he's grew up in this area, played ball in this area. Has been a long time coach in Northern Virginia. Been a college coach, what's this year, fifth, sixth year, Mike? Uh, this season, year number seven just ended. Seven. Prematurely. 
So yeah, the six and a six and a tenth. Um, but uh, Coach Cassidy is is very well respected. Um, runs the Metro Senators as well, um, and we are extremely happy to to have him on this call. Uh, a couple people that I may go to as well, Coach Warren. Um, you'll see, you should see on the screen, I made him a co-host, uh, has been in the showcase baseball, uh, circuit for 25 years, I bet. Does that sound about right? Coach Warren? Sounds about right. Kind of runs together. And, and, uh, been in the head, been a head high school coach for about that, uh, for almost that same period of time. Um, and Mark, give a quick wave, uh, a parent, uh, as I said, of a, of a, rising college baseball player. His son's a catcher at Madison High School and is going on to play at Roanoke um, and uh, has spoken a couple times about the college recruiting process. So we may jump over to the two of them as well. So let's go ahead and jump in. Again, please fire out the questions in the chat. I'm going to ask each of our panelists to just say a few words uh, before we get going on the questions. Uh, Andy, let's start with you. Yeah, listen, everybody, there are so many questions that we always have about the recruiting process. And now during these uncertain times, uh, you know, the recruiting world's uh, changing even more so. But I think that uh, the main point I want to get across, which I think will sort of a blanket statement, and it's obvious when you think about it, is that next year in college baseball will be the most talented group of baseball players playing college baseball in the history of college baseball. Okay, and the reason is because you have some seniors that are going to be returning for an extra year of eligibility. And you have a group of current seniors in high school that are going to be going on to play in college. So you have this balloon of players that are showing up in the fall, which is typically a lot of baseball players. You know, some programs you're going to have 40, 50, 60 guys, depending on the program, showing up to fall uh, practices. And now you're adding even more players into that balloon. And it's going to be more competitive than ever. So I'm sure some of the questions that you guys might have, whether you're a rising senior in high school, uh, you're going on to play in college next year, is uh, what does that mean for me individually going on to play in a going to play at that college? And I think the best answer is you got to be ready to compete once you show up on campus, which is always the case, but now it's uh, more so than ever. And for those players that have verbal commitments to play at a college or a university. Uh, please remember that verbal commitments are not binding, okay? Uh, national letters of intent for Division I are binding, but verbal commitments are not, and you need to have those conversations with your college coach if you have made a verbal commitment to a school to see exactly where you stand and fit into that program. Great. Thank you, Andy. I'll move over to Coach Cassidy. Let him say a few words. Welcome. Uh, I want to thank you guys for having me. Um, it's great to be on this uh, call with a, a bunch of great baseball minds and, and good friends of mine um, that I'm always learning from. Um, I think number one, um, I'm, I'm, I'm available to answer questions as a college coach first and also as someone who helps people get into schools as much as I can with the travel organization. So, um, but I, I think everybody, it's time to take a deep breath. Okay, um, there's a lot of anxiety out there, especially with the 2021 class, because you missed your whole senior season. And that's understandable. That's, that's, that's a big deal. But at the same time, you're not alone. Every single 2021 in this area in the state of Virginia lost their, lost their season in other states as well. So for me, it's time to stop feeling like a victim it's a horrible time for everybody but just like if we were playing whoever is doing the most stuff right now to make themselves better whether it's physically mentally spiritually emotionally you're gonna be ahead of everybody who doesn't do that just like if we were playing whoever's working the hardest whoever's communicating the most is going to be ahead of everybody else so for me I would be doing anything I can right now to get my name out. Everybody has a lot more time making videos, working on my craft and working. You're going to hear all the coaches talk about this um, and working on my baseball IQ. This is a time where we have a lot more time to watch baseball, to, um, you know, take quizzes on the internet, anything I can do to make myself a smarter baseball player 
So my game's even better when I step on the field, you know, when, when we all have the light at the end of the tunnel here. Great. Thank you, Coach Tugwell. I want to welcome you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, Rob. Uh, uh, we've been blessed to do a number of, of these uh, recruiting seminars over the years. And uh, also myself, personally, I've done probably 150 home visits of uh, used to be mostly seniors, but uh, I think uh, probably around 2000, uh, I started with sophomores. And uh, it, it basically was, uh, these were, were people, kids, uh, players that uh, wanted to play at the next level. So all these people had aspirations to play above uh, high school. And so the things that we, I sat down with them on about a two hour stint uh, was uh, understanding the recruiting process, understanding about scholarships, um, setting up personal goals, uh, finding out what a match is, understanding that the uh, recruiting process is much more than just baseball, understanding, uh, you know, it's a financial understanding of your parents, um, just knowing what matches up for you and, uh, and your family. So um, that's, I hope, some of the questions that we'll talk about today. Great. All right, let's jump right in. Uh, Remigio, I hope I'm saying that right. Um, I'm going to throw this one to Andy. Mike might have something to add to this as well. Uh, Mike touched on it briefly. But Andy, since we're not playing, Coach Bradley, since we're not playing right now, what are the best ways to get noticed by colleges? Because I know you're doing something with the Bradley Baseball Academy and your guys to do that. And then Coach Cassidy, you You'll probably have something to add with that as well. So yeah, and I'd love to get I'd love to get Coach Cass's uh, thoughts on it as well. I mean, my what we're doing with our guys and just well, even before I tell you that, just talking to college coaches, uh, whatever level uh, these college coaches are at, you know, Division One, Power Fives, small Division Three, private schools in the Northeast and anywhere in between, um, they need as much information as possible without being able to have, uh, you know, actual intimate exposure on players like they typically would on the field. So uh, the obvious answers are video, okay? Any sort of video footage that you can compile, clean it up, make it neat. If you're a position player, uh, you know, if you can get, you know, 45 to 60 seconds of you hitting, 45 to 60 seconds of you uh, at your position, whether you're fielding ground balls as an infielder or as an outfielder taking five balls and making throws, um, or catchers, whatever it might be. Um, if you're a pitcher, uh, pitcher only, you know, 60 to 90 seconds if you've thrown on the mound uh, from the side angle, okay, and also from uh, behind uh, is typically what college coaches are asking for. So uh, don't send them, you know, you don't need to send them a five-minute length uh, video with, you know, Bruce Springsteen music in the background and all the bells and whistles, you know, they're looking for strictly content. And I know coach Cassidy's probably received every kind of recruiting video in the world. And uh, that's why he's laughing right now. Cause he's seen those, but something simple, uh, strictly content to them. Now, if you want to go above and beyond to get content to uh, college coaches, any sort of data analytics is going to go a long way. Now we don't all have access to that, but we do all have access to uh, a phone and a, and a video camera. When I talk about data analytics, I mean, you know, if you have any uh, footage of you thrown with a radar gun or exit velocity, you know, batted ball off of the tee, great. If you can even take it up another level to Rapsodo or Diamond Kinetics or Blast Motion, some of these other things that really uh, dive deep into the data analytics, college coaches are, of course, going to want to see that. The last thing I'll say before I kick it over to Cass is either way, unless unless for some reason we don't get on the field this summer, I, I still think the college coaches are going to have to see you on a field in person at one of their camps, at a tournament, whatever it might be, before they extend any sort of, you know, offer, uh, significant uh, interest, whatever might have you. Um, if that does not happen, if for some reason this pandemic carries on and we're not able to get on the field in front of college coaches for a considerable period of time, this might be the way that they recruit. But again, as fluid as the situation is with the uh, uh, coronavirus, we're going to stay as fluid as we possibly can with getting proper exposure to the college coaches. Thanks, Coach Bradley. Mike? Uh, everything he said was, was spot on. Um, and to go, to go one step further, number one, this is the best time you could ever imagine. There's, there hasn't been a time like this to make personal relationships with college coaches. 
they have time, you have time. They want your attention just as much as you want their attention. And it has to come from the players. <laughs> this stuff cannot be going out from parents. We mm -hmm. can tell when a, when a, a blast email goes out to 10 teams uh, or 10 schools, they all, and, and all you're doing is copying and removing one name and putting a different name in there. Okay. It should be personal to that coaching staff, something about their record last year, something in particular about their school, but build relationships. This is the time that, that we have time to call people and communicate. We're usually on the field six days a week right now. And the one day that we have off, we're spending with our families. So, I mean, this is a great time to build relationships. Players do that, not parents. Great. I just want to add, and this is, a, a, I guess, as a plug, but it's free. Um, it, what we're going to be launching, and, and Mike and Andy are involved at our, with our PSL League, um, on Monday we're going to be launching a huge opportunity for middle school, mainly high school players, um, to use an online player, plat, player profile platform through NVTBL that we're going to be blasting out to college coaches um, in, in, in states within 500, 600 miles from here, um, where you'll be able to post, create your pro, player profile pages and, and post a lot of this information. We'll also be having, as we've talked about with our PSL organization, some Rapsodo data opportunities uh, coming up once we can all get back on the field that Coach Bradley was talking about. So keep, uh, keep, keep looking on Twitter. You'll see something Monday, maybe Tuesday. Uh, about this option. It's totally free. Uh, I want to throw uh, a question. Hey, Co Coach. Coach, can I add one more yes. thing? Yes. So we've talked about um, videos in the baseball side and metrics. We've talked about personal relationships. Um, if you can't get into a school, there's no point of sending anything to that school if, but for grades. Any, any of you players out there, I know Fairfax County, what is it if you 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 have the option to take a class and it can't hurt your grade it can make it better you can improve your great grade. grades have to be number one be doing anything you can right now to raise your grades especially when we're not going to be able to take s or probably not going to be able to take sats okay grades are number one okay coachability is number two family life three then the baseball stuff because there's tons of great baseball players out there it's what intangibles do you have that fit my school. Perfect segue into the exact question I was going to ask Coach Tugwell as, as a former guidance counselor. And, and it's more of a statement that I want you to react to, Coach Tugwell. And it's, it's regarding academics and the importance of them. And um, if you could just sort of take us through a, a general high school career, freshman, sophomore, junior, not, not too specific, obviously. Um, a, on the importance of academics when you talk to college coaches, but B, what they sort of have to get together um, and what they should focus on versus, you know, taking more difficult classes that they may not get as good of grades on or taking easier classes where they could get A's and just sort of that whole academic topic, if you could just touch on whatever you think is important there. I agree with those guys um, in terms of the academics. I think we lose sight of that sometimes. If you're a recruitable athlete and you're in one of the top players in your position and all that kind of stuff and you got people talking to you, yeah, the grades might not matter quite as much. Um, but for most of us, uh, knowing, I think, for people to understand what the scholarships, I guess it's still 11-7 for a D1, right? That hasn't yep. changed. Um, and, and not a lot of money. It's, it's just baseball is not a lot of, there's not a lot of money out there. So for the most part, you're going to have to get in on your own. Um, I, for me, the most important word in this whole process is proactive. I, I think you have to be proactive through the whole process. I think uh, if you wait around for the phone to ring, you're, you may be missing the boat a little bit. And I agree with Mike in terms of having an understanding of, of what it takes to get into a school and, and what it takes to, to stay there. You know, you're playing four or five games a week when you get into college, and, and if you're not ready for it, you could have trouble and, and uh, not handle it. So I think getting a game plan very early on. The recruiting process in baseball has changed a lot. Um, I think uh, uh, for some schools it's still junior seniors, but for some other schools, bigger schools, um, they're getting commitments when kids are in the ninth and 10th grade. 
Um, so a lot of that is predictability and you better have your ducks lined up to keep your grades up or, or that's, you know, they can, they can take it away from you. Um, so again, I, I think uh, the whole thing about getting a game plan and having a uh, kind of a roadmap to success is really important. I think writing things down is important. Uh, we talk about it, but if we write it down, it might become a, a more of a goal for us to deal with. Um, again, that's, that's part of, I think, in, in the whole thing as we go through it. I, I think uh, um, the, the idea of proactivity starts with the things that they, the, the guys were just talking about, getting in touch with them, um, sending videos, all of that kind of stuff. And it, it's just, it starts from where you are right now and it will go all the way through your, your senior year. Yeah, and I, I think that's a, one of the biggest um, myths in the recruiting process is I think a lot of, a lot of, a lot of players and parents seem to think that, um, you know, everybody's going to come to them and come after them. So I think being proactive and doing the things that these guys are talking about. It, Robbie, you asked me yeah. about the academic stuff. For yeah. me, the most significant thing in terms of picking your classes is to take as tough an academic load as you can handle well. Okay, if you're taking AP classes and you're not doing very well, it's not gonna help you in the long run. So, um, you know, certainly um, having an understanding of whether or not you're working to your full capacity as a student, most kids, when you ask them, hey, were your grades reflective of what you really know and what you can do? And most of them say no. So I think uh, having a goal of, of playing college baseball and getting your act together and, and working to your ability the best you can certainly can help the whole process as you go through it. Good. All right, I got a question on here from RC. Uh, what's more important, going to a university prospect camp you're interested in or just utilizing a showcase team and get exposure uh, to college coaches that way? Andy or Mike, which any, what do you want to jump on that one? Why don't you set the table, Mike? I'll, uh, I'll be the man in the East. <laughs> All right. Uh, uh, to me, I, I kind of cut it up a, a couple ways. If, if I like guys, if they're in their area and they're young and they're not used to performing in front of coaches, to go to an area school, get, get some work, get used to it. Showcase is great for figuring out who's out there looking for you. If you're really serious about going to a school, that's always the best way to get on their campus. Most of them are going to have a, most schools are going to have a, a, a visit afterwards, like a free tour. Um, you know, it, it's a, it's a more intimate setting than um, being out at a tournament. But again, if I would only do that, if I have a relationship with those coaches, if I am realistic with myself and I feel like I can play at that school. If not, you're just wasting your money at that point. So I, I think it depends on where you are in your career, what your relationship is with those schools. Um, you're going to see get seen more out at tournaments. Once you start funneling it down to people who are interested in you or you feel like you have a real shot of playing at that school, it's your dream school, then that is always the best option. Um, is to get in front of one staff at a time. Yeah, and I, I'll what I'll go off of is um, this is this is a budgetary financial question. I think uh, as much as any other aspect to it. Okay, you because we don't have the season, the spring season going on right now. This is a great opportunity for families to sit down and go through. Okay, how much money am I willing to spend for? Uh, my son's college recruitment process, okay? Uh, his development with private hitting coaches, uh, the summer travel season, all, you know, everything that goes into that and start to decide, okay, where does it fall in line with your family's budget, okay? Now, if you're a family that has uh, unlimited resources, okay, and you're willing to spend a lot of money, sure, you can go to a lot more showcase camps uh, than, the other, than other families. But if you're gonna be, you know, if you're gonna be, tight with your money in, in certain areas and you want to, uh, you know, not go to just as many showcase camps possible, which is the, the vast majority of people um, going through the recruiting process. Then my suggestion is kind of going off of what coach Cass is talking about is this funnel. Okay. You need to be seen by a large group. Okay. So whether that's a large showcase uh, 
camp, you know, like a top 96, head first, uh, show ball, one of those, okay? And see what kind of significant interest you're getting at one of those camps that has a lot more college coaches, you know, 50, 60, 80 coaches at that. And then while that is going on and while you're going through the recruiting process, you need to be doing your research on fit of a school, okay? And starting to decide, not necessarily do I want to go to uh, an Ivy League school or do I want to go to a Big East school, but it's, okay, region, it's uh, academic uh, requirements, um, school size, region, everything that goes into uh, what's going to make a proper, uh, a holistic fit for you in the college experience, okay? And then based off of that, you'll be able to decide on which of that big events you want to go to and where you're getting interest from, from some of these schools that you see yourself going to do, whether baseball doesn't work out or not. And I know this is a very long way of getting to the answer, but what we're trying to do is narrow it down, okay, for, you know, to get to three, four, five schools that are really on your list that you think, you know what, I could play there. I could um, I'd be competitive from an admission standpoint. I want to go to their school specific camp. And like Coach Cass is talking about, that's the best way for you to get to meet their entire staff, to see the campus, to see how they run things, to see how you stack up against other players that are very interested in being student athletes at those schools and, uh, and start to make a decision. Okay. But I would not work the reverse way where you go to just, you know, the University of Maryland team camp and then the University of Texas team camp where you have not received any interest from them. And technically, and really, you don't know even if you could play there, if you could get into those schools, I'd work your way uh, from the other end. Yeah, that's a perfect segue. This is the list I was just getting ready to ask you guys about and, and uh, try to wrap that up. I think, you know, the budget, and I'm glad Coach Bradley brought this up. You know, there's two reasons to think about the budget. One is what are you spending now at the middle school, high school level? And two, what can you afford to spend at the college level? And, and just to add a little bit to what Andy was saying, because there is a question here about uh, from Jamie, are groups such as NCSA worth it? There's all kinds of uh, web-based options, field level, baseball factory, NCSA, CBI, uh, a number of different things, some of which are, are free or very inexpensive, and some of which have player profiles that are, that are, that are expensive. And the things that I had listed just to add to, Andy, is what decisions you make there, um, what team you play on from a showcase perspective, what college camps you go to, what are you spending on instruction, and then what are you spending on the physical side, bigger, stronger, faster. Um, and I think making sure that we understand that we're, we're spending enough both time-wise and resource-wise to get bigger, stronger, and faster because you players have to get to their man body as soon as possible in order to be recruitable athletes. And uh, we'll, we'll let these guys talk a little bit more about that. But I wanted to throw it to Coach Tugwell real quick and just talk about, you know, I know you've for years have been, uh, been doing these with you and you always talk about, you know, targeting schools to build off what Coach Bradley just talked about, sort of the three, 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 three schools that, you know, maybe reaches the, the uh, academically and, and baseball wise, and then three that are, attainable and then three um you know that you know you could play out and get into you want to talk about that a little bit in terms of you know that road map and and starting to think about um schools well you know robbie i think things have changed a little bit um you know when we were doing all a lot of these recruiting seminars it was basically uh seniors um, you know, now you've got to start a little bit earlier. And matter of fact, a lot of, a lot of commitments are made again in, in the 10th grade now. Um, so you kind of got to get your act together a little earlier, probably. Um, I just, I think one of the things in the process, um, which we don't realize until maybe our senior year, are needs. Um, I, mean, I mean, if, if Mike's team, you know, if he's just recruited a shortstop, um, you know, he may not need a shortstop the following year and you're a senior. Uh, I know when you're a sophomore and you make a commitment, you're not going to know two years in advance what's going to happen. You'll lose some people to the draft and stuff like that, but uh, people transfer and, and needs change. But needs are really important in the recruiting process. As far as picking schools, um, I know that's the way we used to do it. You know, the three, three, and three. I'm not, I think kids probably overall apply to more schools now than they did, um, you know, 15, 20 years ago. 
Um, as far as the baseball stuff, I agree with you guys. I think the thing, and it's always been this way in the last 10 years, is getting on campus um, and the way to do that. And, and I think the camps, when we were working them, were, most of them were a week long. Now they're only, what, two or three days. You can get to a lot more. Uh, it, it spends your money a little bit better and, and getting people to know you and, and, as they said, developing relationships. So, um, you know, again, I think all of the stuff they said about the match is so important. I think you have to have an understanding of where your skills are. But if you're a 10th grader, you still got room to grow. That's one of the problems in the recruiting process is the kids are having to make commitments too early today. And they don't, you know, there are a lot of kids out there that are seniors probably this year who lose all that that have really improved. And um, some of that's taken away. So it's a unique experience. But, you know, I think the overall process of the stuff we're talking about hasn't really changed. And you need to be proactive and have a game plan, uh, have an understanding of what your parents can afford. You know, for the most part, you're not going to get a lot of money playing college baseball. So you're going to have to, you know, you're going to have to uh, afford it. And with all the other stuff coming in terms of, you know, how do you get better and how many camps and all that stuff, it's, there's a lot out there and a lot of money to be spent. Yeah, and can I segue this into, and, and what Coach Tugwell and I were talking about is picking three schools that are, are dream schools that may be a reach either baseball-wise or academically, three um, that uh, you, you may have a chance to get into and or play at, and then three that you're pretty sure – uh, that you could play at and, and get into. Um, but doing an exercise like that, I think, starts to focus the players um, to think about all those things that Coach Bradley was talking about. And I'm going to throw it over to Coach Bradley to talk about this a little further is, is how do these play, how do these parents sort of force these players to start thinking about rural versus urban, big, small, north south financially you know whatever it may be all those things um what can they do or what do they need to do uh to start thinking about those things um so that they could conceivably make a 333 or a 555 list as they go through this process yeah and i just noticed the um the link that you just put up on the chat and that's that's a great you know i've been checking that out since you mentioned it a few months ago at our uh, big board meeting and you know there, there's so much information on the internet and you know I think that if you are if you're a high school student let's say you're a ninth grader or a tenth grader and you've never been on a college campus before you need to go on a college campus that's locally okay now I know right now that's that's kind of difficult but when we do uh, get clearance you need to get on a college campus that's closest to your house it doesn't matter if you're interested or not so if you live close to Marymount if you live in Arlington go to Marymount's campus and walk around when the students are on campus, just to kind of get a sense of it, okay? I think that when you go to a college campus, you're gonna start gathering information about things that you like. Like, hey, this school right here is, uh, you know, uh, in an urban setting, okay, in the middle of the city. Well, let me start looking up some schools that are in urban settings that I think, you know, academically, I've got a, I've got a really good GPA. I test pretty well. I'm going to start looking at some of these top schools in the country. Well, let's start looking at all the urban schools in the area. Let's look at Wash U. Let's look at Columbia. Let's look at NYU. Let's look at all these different schools that can give me that city feel to it. Maybe you want a rural setting, okay? And you are, you know, maybe you're a 3 student with, you know, I'd say 1050 to 1200 SATs. Okay, then you can start looking at some of those schools that might fall more into that category. And you can find out all this information on so many different websites on the internet. The one that Rob just put up is great. You can, um, you can go to uh, the school's website to find out a little bit more. You can follow them on uh, social media. But yeah, I think that just finding out, I, I've, heard, I've heard a number of families, hundreds that have, come, that have you know, played for us that have said, you know, a player will say, well, I really wanna play in an Ivy League. Okay, well, playing in an Ivy League school is, to, to say that I want to play at Dartmouth and that I want to play at Cornell and Columbia, those are three completely different experiences between playing in New Hampshire, Ithaca, New York, and the Upper West Side in New York City. So it's what you're saying is you want to play at a high academic school, but you're basically going off of the namesake of that school. So if you want to play at a school like, you know, a uh, Columbia, then you're probably also going to like maybe some of these Division three schools 
uh, that are very similar to that, but they don't have the Ivy League name. But maybe you can play at that school because it fits more into where you're at ability-wise. So um, I know I kind of went off topic a little bit there, but just trying to think about the fit and what you want out of the experience rather than getting caught up in the namesake of the school or, you know, uh, whatever the conference that they're in. Hey, in the spring, go see a college baseball game. In the fall, yes. go watch a practice. Mike, they can come anytime they want and watch you practice, right? Losing. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Yes. Yes, sir. So, so you, we can get on. Ahead. Anybody could walk at any time and watch you see, see you play or watch you practice. Yes, anybody can come out. And you can go to any uh, – admissions office you call them they'll get almost every school in the country you don't have to say anything about baseball we'll give you a tour of their of their campus and and the three of you don't you think uh and i think andy touched on this briefly but i know it's like pulling teeth as a parent of a of a student two students in college right now one in high school it's hard to get these kids to go see campuses but one of the things that that seems to work is as you are traveling, hopefully all this, these restrictions get lifted, but wherever, you're going to the beach, you're going on summer vacation, you're driving here, there, or you're playing in tournaments with the Metro Senators or Bradley Eagles or whatever, um, go drive through three or four campuses. And even if it's just a drive through, um, say, oh, this feels good to me, this doesn't. Uh, but at a minimum, driving through campuses. So. Uh, I love what Andy said with that, but just just see, get on as many as you can anytime you're traveling. I wanted to show you this College Baseball Insights real quick. Can everybody see that screen I have up? Yes. Um, very inexpensive way, but this is James Madison University. Players just distributed by state, players distributed by position, team roster insight sites, what Coach Tugwell was just talking about by grad year. Um, Team performance, they were 10 and 6. They didn't play any conference games. Financials, um, about the school. Look at this, all this different stuff. Crazy amount of information, um, and it's exactly um, what, what all these guys are talking about. I think it's like $19 a month. What I would do is spend 20 bucks, and then right now and over the next month, dive as deep as you can into a website like that. Um, so I just wanted to share that and add to sort of what Andy said. You guys have anything to add before we jump to the next question? I think, um, I, th I think the number, sorry, Andy. No, no, go for it. <laughs> I, uh, I think the number one question that you guys should all be asking yourself as student athletes is would I enjoy going to this school for four years if I wasn't playing baseball? Yes, good one. Coach yeah. Bradley? I was just going to chime in about the end, the question about NCSA, you know, because I don't think – I think the it's not a clean answer or a direct answer, but, you know, are groups such as NS, NCSA worth it? And for those that aren't aware on this web or on the Zoom meeting, uh, NCSA is, um, you know, they're a service that helps out with recruiting and sends emails and, you know, I don't know all the exact details of it. My answer to that is look at all of the people that are, you're surrounded with that could be um, – could, could help you out during the recruiting process. If you have a high school coach who is just historically known for having very good contacts and reaching out to college coaches, and you play in a travel program like, you know, like Coach Cassidy's, and you know that they're going to do their best to help in reaching out to college coaches for you, then having NCSA might not necessarily be at the top of uh, at your list of where to spend your funds. Okay, maybe money for that could go towards going to some sort of showcase camp or an event or a private hitting coach or whatever. If you're playing for a high school coach who really, you know, his first year on the job, he doesn't really know, you know, a lot of the college coaches and you're not sure where you're playing travel baseball and you have um, unlimited resources or more resources to spend on that, maybe that's more geared towards you, okay? And that's just sort of a, you know, that's the cleanest I can be and the most blanket statement I can be about it. Is it going to hurt you to have NCSA? Certainly not. Um, but I think you just have to look at, you know, kind of like what Rob was talking about earlier about where you want to spend your money and when you want to spend your money. Great. Before I'm going to ask Mark a question here in a second, but before I do that, I think uh, I, I want to ask Coach Tugwell or throw something to Coach Tugwell. And I think it's important for kids to understand this. I think 
people, parents and players are always sort of looking who's in the stands. We're at this dynamic event or perfect game event or high school game or whatever it may be. Who's here watching me right now? We get so concerned with that. And I think we fail to understand that the true people we should be showcasing for are our high school coaches and our summer fall coaches, because those are the people that are going to be talking to these college coaches about you uh, and, and the other people with the contact. So, Tug, can you just add a little bit to that and, and understand, help everybody understand sort of what the key factors are and not not over concerning yourself with getting in front of people all the time but but getting better getting bigger stronger faster playing the game the right way whatever well, I, I guess part of this deals with travel baseball and I know Chris Warren sir, and Mike and Andy and you all of us can address the, 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 what's happened in travel baseball in the last 25 years you know initially when travel baseball started around early, late 90s I guess um, you had few teams and and when we went to places, you had the showcase fields. Uh, you didn't have to go to outer fields. There was a limited number of teams. The college coaches were all there. Now you've got everybody playing uh, travel baseball. I don't think it's for exposure anymore. I think uh, uh, you don't know who's going to be there. There's so many teams, so many fields going on. I think it's really hard. I think it's changed a lot. And these guys can address that because they're still doing it. But a college coach today just doesn't usually show up to a field in a game. They kind of know who they're wanting, wanting to look at. So I think back to my original thought of being proactive, you know, for me, if I really liked Mike Cassidy's, I would, I'd be proactive and find out where they're playing. You know, where are you going to be? You know, not necessarily where I'm going to be. Uh, where's the college coach going to be? Maybe I'll deal with something like that because of that. Uh, but I think it's much tougher today because of the way that travel baseball has gone. Yeah, and just to piggyback on that, and Coach Warren, you could take 30 seconds on this. When Coach Warren and I and Coach Tugwell and, and started in the showcase business 25 years ago to expand on what Tug just said, you know, every weekend in the fall, all the coaches went to one place. So it was Long Island this weekend. It was Tidewater the next weekend. It was boom, boom, boom. Now there's – 15 events every single weekend. And I think that's what Coach Tugwell is talking about. So, Chris, you have 30 seconds to add to that? Coach well, Warren? no, it's, it's definitely changed. I mean, it's, it's uh, I think, a lot in some ways more difficult for uh, the players today. But I think what I would say is what you hit on. You know, you, you're practicing and playing every day in front of your high school coaches. And then when you transition to the summer and fall, it's the same thing with your travel ball coaches. If you're a player – Impress them first, be where your feet are, and that at the end of the day will, I think, do a lot more than, you know, going to a million showcases, which may or may not help you. Um, that's really important. And I think what Coach Cassie said is very true. If you're looking at a school, the first question you should always ask yourself is, is uh, hey, do I want to be at this school if baseball is not part of the equation? And if the answer is yes, then and baseball can also be part of it, then you may find your dream school right there. Perfect. All right, I want to transition to Mark and give him 90 seconds. And the question to you, uh, as I said, Mark's a, a, a parent of a player and has been through this process over the last three or four years. His son has played at a high level uh, from a showcase perspective on showcase teams, but uh, uh, is going on to play at Roanoke next year. And if you had – Mark, 90 seconds to share with these other parents and players uh, from a parent perspective, what would be the important things you would focus on, um, you know, speaking from a parent's perspective? Sure, thanks. And, and I, I think the first thing I would say is, is, you know, right, this is such a strange time, too, because this is, this is a, you know, a, a, especially for a kind of, uh, you know, juniors right now, um, this would be kind of a key recruiting time for the high school year and then into the summer. So, but I would tell the parents, everyone kind of don't panic. And everything I'll say in my now 70 seconds is that I went and I did everything kind of wrong. And so I love talking about <laughs> things that I, that I think can help. But, but look, everyone's in the same boat now. So everyone kind of take a deep breath. I would say as a parent right now, you have a great opportunity. Um, you know, most, a lot of kids who are, uh, you know, juniors and some sophomores, have, you know, have a driver's license. So, but guess what? They're stuck at home now. So parents, like you can actually spend time with your kids. You can go hit with them. You can go do long toss. 
Um, so it's a great time to connect with your uh, uh, with your kid. And again, the bigger, faster, stronger. I mean, you know, lifting is huge. Uh, you know, people always ask me, my son's a catcher, like what kind of fancy stuff did you do? And I said, look, the, the biggest jump um, is when he started lifting. Um, but let me just, uh, just piggyback on one quick thing because you guys talked about something that helped for us is the list. So, you know, we did the list and it was five, 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 but it was kind of D1, D2, D3. And that list we did in ninth grade when my son was in ninth grade. And, and when we took it out, when he finally decided where to go to school, which is Roanoke, that was on there. Um, and it's really important too, because, and, 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 you know, what I've told and, you know, told folks in some, in some of your other seminars is that, you know, while everyone, you know, it, it's good to strive to play the highest level you can, you know, make sure those D2, D3 coaches, the JUCO coaches, make sure your son um, uh, stays really kind of in contact with them because there's high level baseball to be played everywhere. Uh, but keep a really, you know, real huge open mind um, because, you know, even if you're trying to, you're at a, you're at a, a showcase tournament or with your travel team and there's D1 schools looking, guess what? There's other coaches there too, D2 and D3. And your kid has got to be super polite, um, stay in touch with them, treat them just like everybody else. Cause there's a really good chance they'll end up playing there. And that's great because what 7.9% of uh, high school kids play college baseball or is there some percentage like that and that that's a that's a that means if you know if you make it that's a really big deal great thank you I want to transition to uh, another myth and I think so many players and Chris and Andy and and Mike and Tug have certainly seen this over the last 25 years is I think a lot of kids get caught up in that d1 thing um, and I can tell you speaking from my own experience with my oldest son um, is that many, many, many players um, get in the D1 or bust mindset and end up going to a D1 school to maybe try out and don't make the team and regret that decision for many years to come because baseball was such an important aspect in their lives. Again, if that school is a the school they want to go to, like Coach Cassidy said, and, and baseball is secondary, different story. Um, but I, I just want Coach Cassidy to start with this and talk a little bit about – I think people don't understand how good Division Two and Division Three baseball is, and it's a very minute difference in the talent level. Um, there's certainly a depth difference, um, but that there's really high-quality baseball and high-quality experiences that can be found at the JUCO D2 – D3 level. So, Coach Cassidy, if you'd start, and then I'm going to throw it over to Coach Bradley. Yeah, I think the first the first thing I'll say is it, it goes back to what Coach Tugwell said. You have this thought in your mind. You have no idea. Like, come out to one of our practices. Come out to one of our games. You have to go out and see what's actually happening. Um, there's plenty of Division three schools that I, I could count off right now that could – would demolish some division one schools. Um, and, you know, you talk about JUCOs and division twos, some of them are better than some SEC teams. Like it's, it, you know, if you're in Florida and things like that. So I think it's so important to actually research and watch a practice, watch a game before you make a decision on that. The thing that kills me the most, and it happens a lot in our area, unfortunately, is I know guys love the game of baseball, but they decide to just, ah, uh, I love baseball, but I'm going to go to a school and a, a big school and it's over for me. I want to go to football games and stuff like that. And I get that. But in this day and age, almost everyone goes to grad school. And if you love the game, why not go where you can play, get a good education and then get the big school experience for grad school. Yeah. Uh, Coach Bradley. Yeah, I mean, we have the the pandemic coronavirus going around in the country and the world. But the thing that we've had going around uh, with high school players, the pandemic has been what we call D1-itis. And, um, you know, not to make light of that, but that's something that players get infatuated with. They think D1 rather than D3. Um, quick story about my background. I grew up from the time I was born to the time I was 18. I lived in a household with a head uh, Division One baseball coach. My father coached at Jacksonville University and at University of Maryland. So I spent a lot of time. Uh, going to his games and seeing what Division One baseball was like, and that's what I wanted. Um, so I decided to go to uh, West Virginia University, Division One school in the Big East, to play, where I was very much the low man on the totem pole, and I had options to go to Mary Washington and Roanoke and some of these D 
D3 schools, it would have been a much better and more holistic fit for me. As a result, I played for a year and a half at West Virginia, and then I went from junior college to junior college. And I look back on my career, and quite frankly, I, I, I use you know, my experiences uh, to sort of help my players in, for BBA sidestep some of those landmines. Because if I would have really taken a step back and thought more about the fit, I think it would have helped me out uh, a whole lot more. So, you know, just I, I can't stress it enough. You know, I'm going to keep repeating it just to hammer it home for all the families. But thinking about fit, you know, like Coach Warren talked about, and just if you're going to enjoy that experience on campus, okay, and baseball is also in the equation, that's just an added bonus. Yeah, and, can, and just to expand on that, any of you, including Coach Tugwell, I think what people don't recognize if you talk about money, A, there is no money in baseball, as Coach Tugwell talked about. Um, the minimum scholarship is 25%. Very few get more than 50%. Um, but I, what I don't think that people recognize is there's a number of private schools at the D3 level, even though they can't offer athletic money, um, they actually have more opportunities and potentially even more money than the athletic money that you can get from a D1 or, or D2 school. So can one of you sort of expand upon that and, and, and get people to recognize that you can go to a Bridgewater that may be 60 grand a year um, and get academic and or other money and end up paying 20 grand a year like you would at a JMU? Um, and I don't think people realize that. Who wants to take that one? Okay, as you mind if I start on that, and then I want to hear – Obviously, yes. you know, Marymount in particular, but I, what happens is this, we as, con, as consumers get caught up with the sticker price. If we're going to buy a car, we see a sticker price and we're like, I, I can't afford that. But you don't realize that there's room to negotiate. There's nothing different than with these division three schools. Okay. Division three schools have to have a certain sticker price. But if you ask any baseball coach at those school, they probably don't have one player on their roster. Okay. That is paying full freight. Okay, so if you want to go to a University of Rochester and or Sinus, a Swarthmore, and you see, wow, it's 70 grand a year to go to that school, ask how many, how much money they have for merit-based, for special programs that they have, okay? Like if you have a certain GPA or uh, I know one school or Sinus that I mentioned, they have a program where if you're a first-generation uh, uh, high school graduate, you can go to school for free. These private institutions at the Division three level that are not allowed to allocate, allocate athletic funds, they have other ways of getting students in. So you can go to a Division three school for a, a lot less money than going to a you know, Division one school or even some of these state schools, okay? Now, I know, Coach Cass, I know Marymount has um, programs similar to that, but do, what, are some of the, what are some of the programs that you guys might offer some of the players based off merit and whatnot? Well, I, I think that you you said it 100%. It, if you looked at our sticker price, you would think, no way. But nobody pays that. And it gets back to academics need to be number one for these guys. Okay, we're not – even SEC baseball, it's not SEC football. Like, there's not that much money going around. Um, so help your parents out. Help yourself out. Open up doors. Uh, I was at a convent or a uh, camp with coach Billy Brown from George Mason. And he brought up the point. He was like, I guarantee you there's guys going to Marymount that are paying less than George Mason. There's so much stuff out there. It gets back to having good grades and doing your research, finding anything that you can. Um, some of the things that we do, you know, just for being a Virginia student, you get money off. Uh, we're a Catholic university. So if you went to a Catholic high school and this is, uh, this is across the board with a lot of uh, private, private schools across the country, you get money for that. We have a tier system. So if your GPA matches up with your SAT, ACT, there's different tiers of how much money you can get all the way up to a $20,000 scholarship just for having a certain GPA and applying for that scholarship. Great. All right, Tug, I'm going to throw a question at you, and then we're going to get into some of these other questions on the chat. And, 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 and I know it's been a long time since uh, your son Mark went through this process, but I, one of the things that I thought was very interesting, and I know official visits are no longer really in play like they used to be um, when Mark went through this many years ago before he became a, a, a professional player. Um, 
I believe he went on five visits and after each visit, he was 100% committed to go to that school until you talked him into going to another visit. So if, if you want to just expand on that, I think it helps, um, you know, emphasize the importance of going out to see schools. Cause you talk about that real quick. Yeah. I, again, everything's changed cause he was a senior when he was doing official visits. And so he didn't have to make a, he actually, uh, committed early, which was November of his senior year, which uh, I know people like Jamie Stalen remember, because that's probably the same thing they did. Um, yeah, he did, we went to, we went to, actually we did um, four official visits. Uh, first one was Ohio State, the last one was Virginia Tech, and every one we went to, it was, it, again, now that's the ability to be able to meet with a coach. Um, and I, I would offer, um, at some point too, after you've seen the school or even on the visit is to make a, a, a possible, you know, if you think that your ability is close to where you are is to make that call and maybe see if you can uh, meet with a coach while you're on campus. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. You're on campus and, and they can talk to you. Um, yeah, it's, it's uh, being on campus is everything and, and uh, having the ability to talk to the coaches. And our last visit was Virginia Tech and that's where he ended up going. So uh, if that had been the first one, it might have been a different story. But it's, uh, it was, that was uh, not having official visits. That was so cool to be able to be, you know, to, for a baseball kid to be wine and dine a little bit. And the kids miss out on that today. They got to make commitments as a sophomore. Um, some of them probably haven't even seen the school. Um, and, you know, they got to visit on their own dime. And uh, it's changed so much. I hope it comes back the other way at some point. Um, but, uh, yeah. Uh, good question here from Lars, and I'm going to start with Coach Cassidy on this. When emailing a coach to initiate contact, what should you say to make your email stand out from others? I, I, I always say this, and it, you don't, it doesn't have to be anything special, guys. Um, but I always say find something that is specific about that school. Hey, Coach, I saw, I saw last year, you know, you had the best year in program history. Um, that's awesome. You know, um, here are the reasons why I like your school, you know, let me know what I can do to, um, you know, build this relationship or what you would need from me. Yeah, and I think, I think what you're getting at there is, is a making sure that that isn't some blast general email that they're sending to a hundred coaches by right. By saying those things, Andy, anything to add on that before we jump to a next one? No, no, I think Cass nailed it. Okay. Uh, here's a good one. I'm going to throw this to Coach Bradley. Um, it's from Allen. All players, uh, for players who aren't in high school, so eighth graders, at what point should they begin to reach out to college coaches to express hmm. interest? And, and this is for freshmen, sophomores, juniors even. Um, you know, at what point should they start reaching out to college coaches? Yeah, I mean, and Coach Tugwell talked about this. You know, you kind of have to measure your skill set on where you're at and and listen, college coaches are looking to recruit based off of, how, you know, where you're at from a projectability standpoint and where you're going to be at in four years. So it's very easy for eighth graders and ninth graders and parents to hear, well, this eighth grader just committed to Louisville and this ninth grader just committed to UVA. And that means that my eighth and ninth grader is behind. The reality is that that's a very, very small percentage of the student athlete population in, in high school. So uh, if you are, if you're in that age level, okay, if you're in eighth or ninth grade um, and you're that good to get an offer from a power five school that's going to make those offers, you're probably playing on, you know, a team, you're probably one of the better players on your team. You're probably playing on a high level team. And um, I don't think you need to necessarily be as proactive in that cert, uh, situation. You can, you know, play against the best competition and play for a good travel program and I know that there's, you know, some individual events that are out there, but I think that that is a very small percentage and what I would call the exception to the rule. Um, I think that in, when you are in ninth and 10th grade, for the majority, your goal should be developing your skill set, um, physically developing your, your physical uh, attributes, your speed, your strength, okay, your conditioning, your diet, um, doing as well as you possibly can in the classroom, okay, which is always the case. 
and starting to figure out, okay, what are some qualities that I like in my high school? What are some qualities that I like in the campus that I just visited, as, as I mentioned earlier, and starting to come up with qualities to a school, okay? Um, so that would be what we should be focusing on typically for the ninth and 10th grade. As far as reaching out to a college coach, listen, you can reach out to a college coach whenever you want. The problem is if you are prior to September 1st of your junior year, the only email that a college coach at the division one level, the only response he can send back to you is going to be camp related. Okay. That's just because of the NCAA guidelines. So you're not, he's not going to be like, if you ask a college coach prior to that in an email, Hey, do you think I could play at the university of Richmond? They're going to they're going to send you back an email saying, well, thank you for your email. Here's information about your camp or about our camp. We'd love to have you come there. So unless they're very significantly interested in you, um, they're probably, you're probably going to get a camp email. And if they are interested in you, then the way for them to communicate with you would be through a third party. Great. I want to transition, touch on what uh, Coach Cassidy said, throw it back to him. I think uh, he talked about this briefly, but I read an article recently that I think there are 16 schools in the entire country that make money on college baseball. Um, so understanding that is important. Um, but Mike, Coach Cassidy, if you could talk a little bit and add to sort of what Coach Bradley was talking about in terms of timelines um, and, and water cooler talk where, you know, the, there's a freshman at Madison that just committed to an SEC school, SEC school Alabama. Again, an exception to the rule and, and how most recruiting's done, you know, in a much different timeline than a top 25, top 30 SEC, ACC type school. So if you could expand upon that a little yeah. bit. Yeah. You, you, you said it, you said it before, verbal commitments don't mean that much. But first of all, don't listen to other people because most of the time they're lying anyways um, when it comes to a lot of that stuff. And the next, I can't, I can't tell you how many people I hear talk about, oh, he got a scholarship to play Division three baseball. Like, that's not possible, you know. Um, the other thing is, guys, control what you can control. You can't control what other people are doing, the, what, what, what coaches are talking to them. All you can do is control on what you're doing, the process that's making you better. How hard are you working to gain relationships, okay? Um, you know, you might be a better player than someone who's already committed, but, you know, uh, one of the other coaches talked about it earlier. Maybe you're a shortstop and he's a center fielder. And that school, that you're better than that kid, it, they have all the shortstops they needed. They needed a center fielder, okay? It's not about what other people are doing. It's about what you're doing. And I think a lot of times, and I grew up in this area, and I'm, I'm, I'm at fault for this too. Um, we get sucked into this Northern Virginia bubble a little bit where I think, you know, we have it very well and, and – we get a little entitled about things sometimes you got to understand we're only one part of the country. So if, you, if you're the best player in Northern Virginia, you might be the 10th best player in Southern Arizona. Um, you know, you, it, it's, and if you're the hundredth best player in Northern Virginia, you might be the 300 best player somewhere else. So it's, it's not about what other people are doing. Focus on what you can do to get better and, and, and prioritize your goals and, and have something to work for. Um, and don't think that it's just going to come to you because again, I, I heard, I heard Mark talk about, um, 7.5%. I heard it's 5% of players play in college. It's, it's, it's not something that's given to you guys at any level. It's something you really got to work for. And then when you get there, the work is just starting all, all the hard work that you're doing now, it becomes a full-time job with school. Um, I'd actually like to pass it off to coach Warren because we talk about how much people change. He's a high school coach, and, and we in the summertime, we get to coach some of the best players from around the country at all levels, Division I, JUCO, D2, D3. Talk about how much people change once they get to college, let alone from high school to college, that second, third year of college. Yeah, it's a tremendous um, opportunity when you get to a good program. Um, you know, you're an 18-year-old college freshman. You know, all of a sudden you've got – your diet and um, you got a diet plan, you've got a workout plan, you've got, you know, you're working your craft every day. 
um, you really do see guys take off. And as Coach Cassie would say, or was saying, you know, we get guys on our Cal Ripken League team who are um, Division II players, but they're league all-stars in a league that's made up of 70% Division I players. So, you know, that wouldn't seem to make any sense, but that speaks to exactly what he's saying. Those are guys who focused on their craft, they get better. And, you know, you can't get caught up in that D1 mentality. It just doesn't, you got to find the school that's the right fit for you. And there's one out there, but it just might, might not be a Division I school. The other part of this process, I think, that's really important. Coach Bradley was talking about the, you know, D1-itis. You also, as a player, I think, have to ask yourself, how important is it for me to play early? Because do you, are you, do you just want to wear the uniform or do you really want to compete for a position? You know, because if you really want to compete for a position and you don't really have that opportunity at a school, chances are you may want to start looking elsewhere. Um, and then now you start going down that process and that path that Coach Bradley was talking about, JUCOs, transferring credits, lost finances. I mean, it's, you know, it's just really important to find that, that, that right fit. Uh, in this whole process. Good. Hey, Lonnie. Yeah, I got Go I'd like to ask something and to these guys, especially Mike. I think a lot of times the, the, the kids coming up don't have a, a, a sense of what the level of commitment is to play college baseball. I don't care what level. Um, and, and Mike can maybe uh, – is that, well, the, um, the thing I was going to say is what is the daily routine of a – of a college player, and the, and the other thing is the seasonal routine. You know, fall, spring, summer, winter, summer. I mean, you're playing 24-7. It's a big-time commitment. I think that is – that's a, a great question, and any, anybody who's watching that, that this should write that down to find out what – whatever school you're talking to, find that out because it's going to be different everywhere you go. Some people are going to do less. Some people are going to do more. Um, a normal day in our, in our season, in the spring season, um, and this isn't every day, but a crowded day would be something like um, weight room in the morning. Um, they go eat, go to their classes, practice or game, um, study hall. I mean, we do a lot. It, it is full days. Um, we lift after games sometimes. There's always going to be an element of study hall in there, let alone your classes, your online classes, your night classes. So um, learning how to schedule your day at a young age is huge right now for you guys. Okay. Everybody's got one on their phone, Google calendar or whatever you want to use, start breaking your day down minute by minute, hour by hour. And that will help you because prioritizing your time, all it is is going to help you in college and it's going to help you in life. I mean, you people who are going, uh, people are probably going crazy at home right now without a lot of things to do. The first thing I did, and I'm glad I did this was I did a, a, a quarantine schedule. I, I said, and I even added in my hours of social time or watching TV, but I wanted to put it all on paper and write it down. So that I didn't just wake up without a purpose every day. Like, what am I going to do? Then I would be sitting around, playing video games or watching TV all day. Now, it, your schedules will change throughout the year, especially when the coaches can't be with you. But a lot of programs run captain's practices when, when the coaches can't be there. Um, different weight training, different, um, uh, you know, different scholastic things. It, 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 it's, it's, it's a life at that point at most schools. Yeah, can each of you, and I, I was going to ask a similar question to you, Tug, on work ethic, but Andy and then and Tug, can you just add a little bit on the work ethic side, and, and uh, you got to have a love for the game in order to play at the next level as well. Andy, you start, and then back to Tug. Yeah, the best uh, the best advice I got was from my high school coach, Joe Shurik, who, you know, I think all the panelists uh, know, and, uh, you know, he said, you know, you have your academic life, your social life, and your athletic life, and one of those is going to need to take a massive hit once you get to college. And I think that that was some of the best advice I got. Um, now, what I learned through the process, and I even after college, was that my because the obvious answer is your social life should take the massive hit. Um, is that my social life kind of just became part of my athletic life because of all of the great times that I had with my teammates whether it was on the bus trips or 
um, in the dugout or before and after practice or going out or whatever it might have been. So um, it's – you just touched on it, Rob. You have to love the game of baseball. If you're one of those guys who thinks the idea of playing college baseball is a cool one, it's not for you, okay? If you are a guy that just loves the game, it's for you, okay? College baseball is for you. Because I get that question from college coaches a lot or it comes up in discussions with – do you think this is a guy that's going to be able to play here for four years? Not play here for me when he gets here or his freshman, sophomore year, but is this guy going to love the game so much to where he's going to want to continue to play it through the fall, we, uh, you know, four or five week season, the workouts at 6 a.m. on Fridays through the winter, the study halls and everything, summer ball in, you know, North Dakota league or whatever you're going to play. Yeah. I saw James just, just posted on the chat as a D2 player um, and, and, not understanding uh, how, how important work ethic is. And, and Tug, you want to add a little bit to that? And then we're going to go to a service academy question. And then each of you will have a couple minutes to uh, touch upon what else you think we should cover. Tug, work uh, ethic? Yeah, uh, I, I think uh, a lot of kids can get by early um, without a great work ethic. But the higher level you go, then it certainly pays off. Um, I think. Uh, uh, it's nice to have the best player on your team to have the best work ethic. It doesn't always happen that way. Matter of fact, it rarely does. Um, I have definitely have a couple kids that I had over the years that were my best player and, and actually had the best work ethic. And I, obviously they did very well throughout their baseball playing career as well as what they did in life. Um, so, you know, your work ethic's gonna, is, a, is a something that's gonna carry over with everything. And you almost kind of know the players you deal with you know how successful they'll be later in life. So, I mean, I've had I've had a college player come and, and hit on a tee for four hours. Um, he was in college and we were in high school. He came and asked if he could use the cage. And when I finished practice three hours later, he was still on the tee doing different stuff. Um, I had two guys that used to, when we had to pay for lights, um, at, they would come to my house and grab the light key, turn them on and hit from 10 p.m. to midnight. Both those guys, one played four years in college, the other played professionally. They were the best players in the region that year, and they worked the hardest. Great. Um, we got a service academy question. Uh, Coach Bradley, I don't know if you want this or somebody, uh, but I think the specific question was, um, well, how do I express interest in playing for a service academy? In other words, are there any differences in that process? Uh, short answers, uh, probably. Uh, I don't, to be honest, I don't have a great file on it. I think my uh, generic answer is going to be, you know, obviously reaching out to the, um, uh, reaching out to the coach and just like you would with, a nor you know, any other uh, coach from around the country. But unfortunately, I don't have much more of a file on the service academies than that. Yeah, I can add to it briefly. I had a pitcher last year uh, who was interested in both the Naval Academy and West Point and dealt with, dealt with their coaching staffs in that process. And I think the recruiting process is fairly similar. Um, the differences are, you know, the recommendations and other things that you need to get into, you know, a West Point or a Naval Academy. Mike, Tug, or Chris, anything to add with that? Yeah, the only thing I'd say is, Rob, if that is something as a player you're interested in, specifically interested in, in, in a service academy, you know, they, for them, it's a slightly different recruiting process because they're not throwing the net quite as, as wide because the uh, it's if you're interested the more interest you show in them I think that's going to help you in the long run um, because they don't want to waste time recruiting guys who are simply not interested in a service academy experience it's a waste of time for them and resources yeah I have one more question before I let each of the panelists you know give sort of their two minute rundown and that is I'm going to throw this to Tug um, the, the question of course, I forgot the question as I was talking about the panel. <laughs> so I'm going to let you guys get – it was a really good question, too, uh, that, that you guys remember. just made me think of. Uh, but I'll come back to it on the back end. So what I'm going to do is throw it to the three of you um, and go, sort of give us a two-minute rundown on anything else that you would add, um, you know, re regarding this process as a whole. And I'm going to start with Coach Bradley. Well, uh, again, thanks to everybody for, for jumping on. Um, I have uh, three points I want to make that I was just jotting down as we were going through this. Uh, first one is uh, social media posts for players, okay? And Coach Cassie can attest to this. 
make sure you check your social media post. I had a, I had to have a phone call with a player two days ago to tell him to take down a post from a year ago because it wasn't super racy or that much, but it was certainly enough that if a college coach who reached out to me the day before was asking about him, I had to make sure that that post was not on there because that is not something that he needs to be one representing himself um, or BBA. And uh, so make sure that you're checking your social media posts because that is a quick uh, uh, cross through your name on the recruitment list. Okay. College coaches are looking to cross off names. They're not looking to circle or add on to their huge existing list. Next thing is this with what's going on with the coronavirus, especially for you current juniors, I know you're worried about SATs and ACTs. There's already a lot of schools. Okay. That are already test optional because of this. There are rumors that that might more schools might go to test optional with this uh, 2021 junior class because they know that they can't get in to take the SAT or ACT during the spring, potentially summer months, and who knows what's going to happen with the fall. So don't panic on that, um, but just realize that there's a lot of people that are in that boat, okay? Um, and we just have to wait and see what happens with the, uh, with the testing. Um, and the last thing I got is we've talked a lot about recruitment and selection process. As far as your development, guy, whatever drills you're doing, when you do eventually get back on the field, okay, and you're in front of college coaches, college coaches realize that you're going to be rusty. Your bat's going to be a little bit slower than it was, you know, prior to the pandemic occurring. Uh, you're just your in-game uh, movements are going to be a little bit slower. Your jump off the ball, uh, infielders, all of that. So do whatever you can now to get you as in-game ready as possible, okay? And that comes down to. Uh, working on tempo okay stopwatch is one of the great tools that college coaches have it can be all coaches i should say but that can be something that even players can use so trying to get as in-game ready as possible okay and you can be creative with it okay but don't just do reps just to do reps okay try and find a way to get you as game speed and as game ready as possible whether it's throwing a ball against the wall and you got to get 20 throws against the wall in under 30 seconds or under 35 seconds. Okay. And have the stopwatch with your partner there, your parent there, and just try and work on making sure that your uh, internal clock is constantly moving. Okay. That's all I got. Thank you, coach Bradley. I'm going to ask the, the question that I thought about before I let coach Tugwell and coach Cassie get into their last two. Um, and the first one is coach Tugwell, can you talk just a little bit about, um, you know, people do get caught up in scholarships, but but how you could use baseball to get into a school where you may have marginal chances academically of getting into and how, how baseball can help you potentially get into that school. I'm not talking about a big difference academically. I'm talking about a small. So, Well, I mean, I think schools have different levels of you know, I, I know that a lot of the bigger schools, will, they'll have certain slots. They don't like to talk about it, but um, and not every school has that. Some have more than others. Um, so uh, I, I think it's, uh, if you're recruitable, you got a better chance of, of doing, of getting into a school that you probably wouldn't have gotten in before. Um, um, so again, when you talk about certain things, I know people say, well, do you work on your weaknesses? You work on your strengths. I think you work on both. I think if you work on your strength, you, you need to have something that excels. If you're fast, be the fastest guy you can be. If, you, if you're a defensive player, be the best shortstop in Northern Virginia. Work to those abilities, and, and you might have a, a chance to get an opportunity to play at a, at a place that, again, needs that. So as I said before, needs are important uh, in every given year. If, if they just had a shortstop, they don't need one. So it's not that you're not good enough to play at that level, just maybe not at that school. Um, I, I, again, Robbie, I think it's tough to get into a school if you don't have the goods academically, unless you're a special player. Yeah. All right, good. I'm going to lead Coach Cassie. I'm going to lead you in. I'm going to start with a question and then lead you into your two minute closing. And the, the question I have for you is what are the first three to five questions that you ask a high school coach or a summer travel coach, um, or, or, or maybe even the actual player, what are the th first three to five questions in order that you ask about that specific player? That's a great question. I kind of touched on it before, and I, I've seen this on social media, and it's so true. How are, how are his grades? Is he coachable? How are his parents? His parents can ruin it for, for their players without even knowing it. 
if, if we're asking about a player, usually we like him as a player. You know, we pretty much anybody who's coaching can judge whether the player can play or not. And it, it, it leads me into what I was going to say in my final thing. You know, what can you do that has nothing to do with baseball that will make you stick out in a coach's head in a positive way? Okay. Good college programs aren't building good baseball teams. They're building a family. Okay. You guys are most, most college baseball players are going away from home for the first time. And you know, the, 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 the head coach and the other coaches are older brother and father figures. We're building a family. We want to have a cohesive unit. It's culture. Okay. And you know, and, and let, let's be real, unless you are an absolute superstar, you might get more chances than someone else, but 99 out of a hundred coaches are looking for just hard nosed hard workers that fit into their scheme that are coachable that are going to get after it and grind and be gritty. That's what, that's what every, if you have 25 guys, 30 guys like that, you're going to win a lot more games than teams that are full of superstars that don't play together and their culture is not, not, not well. Um, the last couple of things that I'll say is um, I know we talked about how tough a lot of this stuff is, but we're just being real, but enjoy this process. You only get to do it once. People put so much pressure on themselves about this. If you're being recruited or if you are good enough to play college baseball, you, it, that's a blessing. Not everybody gets to do that, especially if you love this game like all of us do, okay? So this is all positive things. Don't put pressure on yourself. What's going to happen? If you put in the work, whatever is supposed to happen is going to happen for you um so yeah i mean it's it's family it's culture it's doing the right things it's intangibles the baseball part of it you know it's it's process over over results man the baseball part will take care of itself awesome coach tugwell give us a couple minutes on closing thoughts from you well i think we've said it pretty much pretty well i think everybody covered it and um the one thing i would just one thing i would emphasize to the people out there to the players as that we really haven't touched on is uh, be a great practice player. Uh, anybody can, you know, play in games and, and all that. But the, uh, I know uh, Westfield High School had, uh, I think I saw it last year, um, get 2% better every day. I think you had that as uh, one of your little talks. Uh, I, I've, I always like the idea of bring passion, attitude, and energy with you every day to practice. That's something it doesn't take a lot of skill, but it certainly um, practice certainly makes a difference. If you if you can't work at it in practice, um, then you're not going to make it. So again, I think the practice part of the the thing is is so important. Also, Robbie, last thing I'd say is that uh, with anybody listening out here, I'd be glad to to do a sit down with anybody. I, I deal with 50% of it; it's academic, and the other 50% is what does it take to play at a higher level. I'd be glad to, uh, you have my contact information. They can contact you. I'd be glad to sit down and I don't charge any money. <clears throat> yeah, it's a, it's a great business model. Um, <laughs> Coach Tuggle has done that for years and years and years and has had a great effect. Uh, I do have one last question. We're going to do a round table. It's going to be Coach Bradley, Coach Cassidy, Coach Warren, and Coach Tugwell in that order. And we're going to keep going until we run out of things. Um, and it's what things can players or parents do to get themselves crossed off a recruitable player list? You know, it could be body language, boom, 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 boom. We each get one word and we'll go through. Coach Bradley. Uh, parent Any handing point? a Gatorade bottle to their son during the middle of the game. <laughs> Love it. Gator Don't that's hand the Frank Leone, That's the Frank Leone one, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Coach Cassidy. Uh, throwing your bat or helmet after failure, bad, bad body language and failure. Body language. Coach Warren. Uh, screaming profanities after popping up and uh, not running out of ground ball. All right. You're, you're using, you, that was two, Coach Tugwell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm going to reverse it. I'm going to say um, to, to run after the foul balls, to get the helmets after doing stuff that are proactive, to have somebody look at you and, and show some leadership. 
And I, I love that. Leadership is showing people what to do, not telling people what to do. And I think all of us are, have been high school, college, or summer coaches, and we, we get those seniors who think, you know, they can be a captain because they tell the freshmen to go chase foul balls or to carry <laughs> the buckets. I think it's, it's showing people what to do. I thank you for that one. I'm going to say how you treat your mother. All right. Coach Cassidy, back to you. Got any more? Um, yeah, being the last one on the field. Or, or the or in the first case, to, uh, Coach Tugwell messed it up because he threw it the other way. But uh, <laughs> or being the first one to leave. What, what can get you crossed off the list? All right, Coach Bradley, same thing. Thank you, Coach. Uh, you give up you – the know, pitcher gives up four hits in an inning, just four rockets, and then an air by the shortstop, and he shows up his teammate. You know, he says, come on, you're the reason that we're in this mess. All right, Coach Warren. Yeah, I would just say anything that makes you a bad teammate and is kind of glaring to anyone watching. I mean, that's that's just like instant. Yeah. Coach Tugwell, another, any more? No, I, th I think I pretty much said I think body language says it all. Mr. Positive. <laughs> grades, grades, <laughs> grades is certainly one, too. Um, I, I, I think what people don't understand is, as Coach Cassidy said, they're looking, and Coach Bradley, they're looking for ways to cross you off the list. Mm -hmm. They're not a public high school coach that can't recruit players, unless, of course, you're Pudge. Um, but you can't recruit oh, – sorry, that was for Coach <laughs> Holly. Um, you, you get what you get. Shots fired. <laughs> but at the college level, right, it's, it's – you got your choice of hundreds, or, hundreds of thousands of players. Um, so I think it's important to remember that. Coach, I got I, I got one yes. that I heard a pro scout use that I, I like using with our summer guys because they're such at, at such a high level. Um, he said he would sit in the parking lot and watch the guys go from their car to the field to see how they were dressed, if their hat was sideways, if they were in uniform, they looked like a slob. That was one way to get crossed off his list. I love that one. Just to add to that, I was uh, fortunate enough to do some stuff with Cincinnati Reds Academy, and I was a bird dog scout, which means I wasn't anything. Um, but we were told, actually on our paperwork, was show up two hours before the game as the scout and watch what they're doing, you know, from the time that they pull up in their car till the time that they leave, stay afterwards, how do they treat their mother, all those things that Coach Cassidy, uh, how do they treat their teammates, and, and they, as a scout or a recruiter, they, those, those guys would rather see you fail when they come watch you play. And that's because I'm going to throw that to Coach Bradley. Why would they rather see you fail than succeed if they're coming out to watch you play? Yeah, I heard, I heard this for the first time. Pete Wilk, head coach at Georgetown, said this at a clinic about eight years ago. And he said, I, our staff will see anywhere from four to 5,000 players come through our emails, whatever it might be, you know, uh, in person. There's going to be about 5,000 players that are looking to play at Georgetown. He's going to have to funnel that down to a recruiting class of about eight to 10 players each year, okay? So he can't recruit all these 5,000. So there's a lot of talented players in there. There's a lot of guys that can get into Georgetown academically out of that 5,000. But he's looking to cross those names off the list so he can eventually get that perfect eight, nine, ten recruitable athletes to come in that next year. Hope that answers the question. Yes, thank you. All right, I, I do see one last question here. When contacting – and then we'll get off. When contacting a coach during this time, how do we begin the conversation? And should we send them – workout film like BP and T work since we can't make game film at this time. Coach Cassidy, really quick, you want to address that? Yeah, same thing, same thing that we were talking about, you know, short, simple, uh, let them do the, do their job by looking at their video. You don't, you don't have to get crazy with it. Something personal about um, their university, why you like the university. Um, you know, it, 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 we don't, nobody wants a, a 10 paragraph email and make sure it's coming from you and not your parents. Uh, I saw another question on there. Who should you re out, reach out for? Um, every program has all their coaches information on their website. So go on there and you're looking for the recruiting pro, uh, coordinator, which is usually one of the top assistants. Um, that's for, always best to go to them first and copy the head coach would be my, um, my recommendation on that. 
Yeah, and with, with what, and this through the help of Coach Bradley, um, I, I talked earlier about the free online player profiles. We have also uh, spent this quarantine time accumulating all the college coach contacts within 15 states of Virginia. Uh, and that includes the website, what conference they're in, what level they're at, and the email and phone numbers for each of the college coaches at every single college that offers baseball. And we're going to be sharing that for free um, with our families um, who are interested in it uh, moving forward. Any last thoughts that we missed, coaches, panelists, before we? I would say thank you, uh, Rob Haney, uh, for, for doing all the stuff that you do on a daily basis to help uh, promote baseball. Yeah, here, here. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, thank you to Coach Bradley, Coach Cassidy, Coach Tugwell. Thank you, Coach Warren hey. and Mark, thank for you. jumping in as well. Thanks, Thank Coach. You. you guys, stay, everybody stay safe, stay healthy, and we'll see you out on the ball field real soon. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Thank everybody. You. Thanks, Rob.